Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm going to be finishing off with Dr. Georgia Purdom's talk where she claims that science confirms Noah's Ark and the Flood. Last time we really didn't get any actual science that would confirm anything. The best she did was appeal to the kinds thing to drastically reduce the number of animals that actually would have had to have been on the Ark in order to accomplish the goal of the story, and one quote-unquote study that claimed that the Ark was seaworthy, which came to that conclusion using data that Answers in Genesis actually rejects. But for some reason, that study's okay, even though they use data that AIG thinks is bad. It's a perfect example of how creationist organizations are quite happy to ignore the methodology of how certain conclusions are reached as long as they reach the conclusions that they like. So let's see if the science gets any better in the second half. So we talked about the ark, we talked about the animals, now I want to talk about the flood itself. Um, because if there is a flood that covered the entire world, we should have evidence of that. Yeah, exactly. And what evidence would that be? Well, for starters, there should be evidence of a very recent genetic bottleneck in every extant species. There is not. There should be archaeological evidence that humanity spread out a bit from the Middle East, and then suddenly all the satellite populations of humans disappeared, and they had to begin spreading out from the Middle East again. But what we actually see is that humanity originated in Africa, and while there were several migrational waves of humans leaving Africa, the one that stuck happened around 80 to 90,000 years ago, significantly before Noah's flood. And not only is there no evidence that this wave of migrants was culled in a global disaster of any kind, but we actually have have archaeological evidence of several cultures on multiple continents surviving right through Noah's Flood without appearing to even notice it. Egypt in particular has pretty thorough written records that pass right through that time period, and in fact the Great Pyramids were built about 300 years before the Flood, and somehow with all of the sediment that creationists claim was laid down in the Flood, the pyramids managed to get through it without being buried or damaged by the Flood in any way? Then there's also the fact of the Flood's physical impossibility, as pointed out by creationist research, which found basically that the amount of energy released during the Flood would have turned the Earth into a giant molten ball. The conclusion of the paper was essentially, hey guys, we believe in an all-powerful magical being, so maybe instead of trying to twist science to make everything physically possible, we just say that that being magicked it. And this doesn't even begin to touch on the mountains of evidence that we have that demonstrates that Noah's Flood never happened. At least not on a global scale. It is entirely possible that it was based on a localized catastrophic flood, as the story originates in a region that likely did experience such a flood about 7,500 years ago, and there's sedimentary evidence of another smaller but still fairly large-scale flood happening about 4,900 years ago. But a global flood is completely scientifically impossible. Now, one of the things that sort of crept into the church, sadly, and into the Christian community as a whole is, well, maybe there was a flood, but it was just a local flood. It was just the area in which Noah lived. It didn't cover the entire world. It is entirely possible that this view is creeping into the church because this is the view that we actually have scientific evidence for. The best evidence for Noah's Flood is that thing that I'm sure she's going to bring up eventually, where pretty much any culture on the planet that lives somewhere that is prone to flooding has a flood story as part of their mythology. Of course, they'll leave out the bit about how these cultures are all located in places that are prone to flooding, because that gives the game away. Of course people who live in an area that was flooded are going to tell stories about the time when their whole area was flooded. And through the magic of exaggeration, this often becomes a story of the time when the whole world flooded. Though often it doesn't even get to that level. I'm skipping this segment because she attempts to prove that the Flood was global from a theological grounding that is meant to convince other Christians that it was global rather than local, but unless you actually believe that the Bible was the word of God, these arguments don't accomplish anything, and since I don't, I really don't care. Now let's talk about the rock layers first, because many of us have been taught that the rock layers um, and other geological structures like canyons take millions of years to form. Not if we've been taught properly, we haven't. It depends entirely on the types of rock, the local conditions under which the rock is forming, and a bunch of other factors. There are some types of rock layers that form very quickly, the most obvious being pretty much any igneous rock that originates from a volcanic eruption. Igneous rocks are formed when magma cools and solidifies, so if a volcano erupts, magma is brought out of the earth to the surface, cools, and solidifies. We now have a rock layer that has formed in as little as 8 months to a year and a half for a lava flow that's about 10 to 15 meters thick, or as long as 20 years for a flow that was 55 meters thick. 
geologically speaking, that is essentially instantaneous. Sedimentary rocks can form relatively quickly as well, that is, if we are focusing on just the lithification aspect of sedimentary rock formation, which is the stage at which the deposited sediment actually becomes rock, and ignoring the weathering, erosion, transportation, and deposition stages of formation. I mean, for instance, concrete is basically a type of sedimentary rock, it's just man-made, and it goes from being a liquid to a solid in just a couple of days. Now, obviously that's with humans making it so that conditions are ideal for it to have such a rapid lithification, but that goes to show that rapid lithification is possible, and the main reason concrete is not considered a sedimentary rock lies in the technicality that it didn't go through the natural deposition process. But yes, some rock types do indeed take millions of years to form, like the limestone chalk deposits found all over the world that are made up of organic limestone that was formed through the slow accumulation of the calcium carbonate scales of single-celled phytoplankton called coccolithophores. Because chalk is a sediment made up of such a lightweight material, it requires fairly calm waters for its formation, something that would definitely not have existed during the flood. There's also way too much of it. Creationists would have you believe that all the coccolithophores that turned into the massive chalk beds underlying much of Europe, the Middle East, and North America all existed at the exact same time, and for whatever reason they all settled to the bottom of this worldwide flood together somehow, with minimal contamination from other types of sediments. Both of those are impossibilities, as the turbulent waters of the flood would have mixed them in with other sediments very easily. In fact, all of the sedimentary rock formed in the flood would have ended up as one single very deep sedimentary layer, rather than the millions of distinct layers that we see out here in the real world. And also, for that many coccolithophores to have existed simultaneously would have choked out all other life, but especially plant life, from the ocean, as they would have blocked the sunlight from reaching any of the other organisms that needed it. And we're used to seeing these geological columns, so to speak, that supposedly represent time. No, they don't supposedly represent time. They actually do represent time, and even creationists agree with that one. They just disagree about how much time. But the question is, is that really true? Or can these types of things form very quickly under the right condition? See, this is why creationists use the oversimplifications that they do. Most rock layers do take a long time to form, so that's something that people will likely vaguely remember from high school science classes. So they present it as though this is the mainstream geological view, and then go, aha, this type of layer can form quickly. So this proves mainstream geology wrong even though it's the mainstream geologist saying that it can form quickly. Just ignore that aspect of it. So we're going to watch a short video about the Mount St. Helens eruption that occurred back in 1980. No, we're not, because I'm going to skip it. There were wonky radiometric dates involved with some of the samples from the Mount St. Helens eruption, and they were the result of xenolith inclusions, bits of rock that didn't completely melt in the magma, and so our old rock that is included inside the young rock that was formed in the eruption. I'll leave a card to a video where I go over that in more detail, but I don't really get into the Mount St. Helens eruption specifically, but all the same principles apply with the eruptions that I do talk about. There's also a nice example in there of the general sloppiness of creationist research. Creationist geologists Steve Austin wrote an article in 1996 where he copied data from the wrong column of a table in a paper on some of these anomalous radiometric dates from lava flows. That original article is still up today, and I know of at least three other places where that data was copied from Austin's article, and as far as I can tell, no creationist has ever even noticed this mistake, much less gone to any trouble to correct it. So what this showed us, a lot can happen, right, if you have the right catastrophic conditions, which we did at Mount St. Helens. They talked about these rock layers there. You can see the person at the bottom for an idea of scale. This is a lot of rock, right? And it was laid down in just a few hours. It didn't take millions of years. It just took the right conditions. Yep. And as I mentioned, there's nothing in geology that excludes rock layers from forming rapidly. Do you know what you won't find in the Mount St. Helens rock layers? Organic limestone, sandstone, chert. Basically, any sedimentary rock except for volcanic plastics will be absent from those layers. Showing that a volcano can form rock layers rapidly does nothing to support the idea that sedimentary rocks that need calm marine environments for thousands to millions of years could have been formed in Noah's Flood. Show me the sediment that becomes chalk, accumulating at a rate of 4 meters per day somewhere. That's the amount that would be required to build the 1500 meter thick chalk beds that exist today over the year of the Flood. And after you show me that? Then we can start talking about how layers like that one can form rapidly. But also, 
It would have to have been much faster than that, as that would only be enough to account for the chalk layer, and none of the other rock layers that are both above and below the chalk in those areas. Oh, and remember how just the chalk alone would have required more coccolithophores to have existed simultaneously than the whole Earth could possibly support? Yeah, well, chalk's not the only organic limestone. In fact, most limestone is formed through the activity of living organisms in one way or another, and there is way too much of it for the Earth to have had all of the organisms making it existing at the same time when the flood hit. They talked a little bit about this canyon called Engineer's Canyon. This was carved out in nine hours. <laughs> yeah, and do you know how it was carved out? When the volcano erupted, it launched a bunch of loose debris into already existing river valleys, filling them up. And in the case of Engineers Canyon, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers formed it by pumping water through it out of Spirit Lake, which had been dammed off by a mud flow. And as a minor point, it was formed over the course of several days, not nine hours. Not that it matters much, but it does show AIG's willingness to bend the truth when they think it suits them. Anyway, this canyon and the other canyons in the area that were formed rapidly happened when a bunch of water, either from the engineers draining of the lake or just from the high amount of rainfall that that area receives every year, rapidly eroded loosely consolidated material. The Grand Canyon, which these canyons are often compared to by creationists, eroded through a bunch of much denser rock, which we know had to have been fully solidified when it happened because of how steep the canyon walls are. Most of the walls in the rapidly formed canyons around Mount St. Helens are at about a 45 degree angle, exactly what you would expect of loosely consolidated material being eroded away. As the stuff at the bottom gets washed downstream, the stuff at the top collapses, forming a slope. But the walls of the Grand Canyon are often perfectly vertical which would not have been possible if the sediment that formed it was still soft when it happened. Not to mention the fact that if those rocks were still soft and the canyon was formed in a violent torrent of water, there would not be clear delineations between those layers. It would have been a big muddled mess with plenty of contamination between layers. That's all it took, right? It just took the right conditions. So it's great observable evidence that it does not take millions of years for these types of structures to form. Some things can form quickly is not in and of itself evidence that all things that are superficially similar to this one thing that formed quickly must have formed quickly. Now, they talked about this canyon. It's actually quite similar in layout to the Grand Canyon. They being the two main creationist geologists, Andrew Snelling and Steve Austin. All the other geologists will tell you that there's basically no similarities between the two beyond the fact that they're both technically canyons. All right, let's move on and talk about the fossils. And one of my absolute favorite finds when it comes to fossils is that we find soft tissue in dinosaur bones. Oh, of course, that's your favorite. Taking bets now as to whether or not she mentions that the amount of soft tissue found was literally microscopic in nature and could only be seen after an acid bath was used to dissolve away the surrounding hard bits. All right, now, why is that so surprising? Because tissue doesn't last millions of years. Well, apparently small amounts of it can if it's undergone a high amount of cross-linking that would have been facilitated by the iron in the bloodstream. And even then, only the types of tissue that are known to start out as the most durable types of tissue are what was found, things like collagen. And worth mentioning is that we know for a fact that even delicate soft tissues can last for millions of years if properly preserved. Insects preserved in amber, for instance, are still made up of mostly soft tissue. So soft tissue lasting so long is not without precedent. We just need to figure out what conditions would lead to such preservation. And Dr. Schweitzer's find led to just that. Free iron molecules promote the cross-linking of proteins. Cross-linking is a key component of preservation. It's how we make leather, for instance. The reason leather doesn't degrade like untreated flesh is because its proteins have been cross-linked. Hemoglobin normally keeps iron trapped in our bloodstream so it can bind with oxygen to transport it around, while preventing it from cross-linking our proteins that, you know, we kind of need them to live. This process would be extremely harmful to living organisms. But once the organism dies, the hemoglobin degrades, and now we have a bunch of free iron molecules that can wreak their havoc on the tissues, making them more durable. And where do we find these tissues? In the centers of bones, the most protected place in a fossilized skeleton. Now, if these soft tissues were indicative of young fossils, why would we not find fossils with more soft tissue than we do? The iron would have been cross-linking proteins outside of the bones as well. Why doesn't any of that get preserved? We have leather shoes that date to 5,500 years ago, that's before the flood. Why would none of the cross-linked dinosaur proteins that were buried in the flood be preserved, but a leather shoe would? 
And I'm going to skip the rest of the soft tissue segment, but I will put a card that links to a playlist all about soft tissue, from such excellent channels as Stated Clearly, Tony Reed, and Paul Agia, all of whom do a much better job talking about it than I do, with Paul even using interview clips from Dr. Schweitzer, the original discoverer of the soft tissue, talking about it. Spoiler, she's a devout Christian who hates it when young Earth creationists use her find to try and support their worldview, because it doesn't. So let's talk about the 4C confusion. This is about 100 years after the flood. And Noah and his family were told to multiply and fill the earth. Well, they multiplied, but they didn't fill the earth. They built this tower, and which was called the Tower of Babel, because God came down and confused their language. Yep, that's right. The story of the origin of the different languages was that God, who the Bible says is not the author of confusion, decided to author some confusion. Now, what reason did God have for this? Well, humans, when unified, were accomplishing too much. Nothing would be impossible for them. Now, we can't have humans accomplishing things, so let's confuse their language to put a barrier between them, making it harder for them to accomplish things. He literally did it because he didn't approve of human ingenuity. And in history's biggest fuck you to God, we now build towers that are much bigger than the Tower of Babel could ever possibly have been. And we have launched rockets into the very heavens themselves and found no doors or windows holding back the waters above, which the Bible says should have been there. All in spite of having different languages. Now what's really interesting is in every, almost every culture of the world, there is a legend about a flood. There it is. I'm actually kind of surprised it didn't come up before now, but anyway, ignoring the fact that the cultures that are most likely to have flood myths happen to be located in places that are prone to flooding, let's look at AIG's chart that shows similarities that the flood myths of 20 different cultures have with the biblical account. As expected, the two accounts that predate the biblical account in the exact area where the Bible was written are the ones with the most similarity to the biblical account, and experts agree that they are related. Though, unfortunately for AIG, they also agree that the Assyrio-Babylonian ones, as they are labeled here, came first. But if we look at the Animals Saved row, for instance, only 5 out of 20 flood myths actually have animals being saved. That's a pretty important feature to be missing. Now, the Russian flood myth they have as being a partial representation of that idea, but I couldn't actually find a Russian flood myth, except for a reference on a website of a quality that I would ordinarily not trust as a source, but it's literally all I could find in this case, where they talk about manuscripts of that part of the event being difficult to read, and describing them as being written in a mixed pagan plus Old Testament sort of way, but with the Great Flood being directed at gods rather than at people. I'm unsure if this means that the authors of that manuscript were borrowing material from Genesis, or if it's just written in a way that reminds them of other manuscripts that engaged in that behavior, but I can't actually find any details about the story itself. Back to the flood comparison chart, I saw that they had Egypt listed as partially representing the biblical idea that the flood was with water. I was intrigued by this, as I'm pretty sure that flooding is definitionally with water, so how can a myth only partially represent that? Well. In the Egyptian story, Ra was getting old, and the people started mocking him, thinking that he was too old and frail to enforce his rule. So he sent his daughter, Sekhmet, to kill a portion of mankind in order to teach them a lesson. But she got carried away with her killing, and killed so many people that their blood flooded the land, and Sekhmet would drink from the resulting lake of blood. Ra, in order to stop her, tricked her into getting drunk, which caused her to reconsider her life choices. You know, as you do when sloshed. And full disclosure, I got this summary of the Egyptian myth from a paper that actually compares the various flood legends of the ancient Near East, and explains how they are all related. Now, I'm not saying that the Egyptian one is completely independent, but I do find it interesting that people getting directly killed by a god's daughter, so many of them being killed that it causes a lake of blood to form, counts as a partial representation of the biblical idea of the whole world being flooded with water. So even with these very loose associations, they still can't find very many flood myths that actually seem more than a little bit similar to the Noah's Ark story. Also worth mentioning is that they consider the Egyptian story to have fully represented the biblical idea of universal destruction. Given that only partial destruction was the goal, and that Ra stopped his daughter before she got everybody, I'd say that that is more of a stretch than calling a flood of blood a partial representation of a flood of water. At least there is water in blood, so you can use that technicality, but universal destruction was neither intended nor achieved, and they call that a full representation of it. Really makes you wonder about all the others, doesn't it? <laughs> 
They, those first four C's really provide the history and the foundation that's necessary for these last three C's, starting with the C of Christ. Um, the birth of Christ is actually first promised in Genesis. Do you realize that? The first messianic prophecy is in Genesis. I mean, certainly there are verses in Genesis that Christians like to interpret that way, but they are far from clear enough to actually draw that conclusion with any kind of certainty. Because right after Adam and Eve sinned, when God is cursing the serpent, cursing Satan, he says this, And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, the capital S. That is a direct reference to Jesus Christ. I'm curious what version of the Bible you're using to get that capital S there, and what in the ancient Hebrew text led the translators to capitalize that S, especially given that this verse is one of the most frequent verses that is subject to mistranslation in order to imbue theological meaning into a passage that is not apparent in the original Hebrew. For instance, there are some translations that capitalize the H on he to make it clear that this is referring to Jesus, though several of those don't capitalize the S on C like this one does. The DRB translation, which is a Catholic translation of the Latin Vulgate, actually says she shall crush thy head, because in the Catholic view, Mary is the one who defeats Satan by bringing Christ into the world. Worth noting here is that AIG typically uses the ESV translation, which has this verse talking about offspring with no weird mid-sentence capitalization of nouns. So for this, they went to what appears to be the New King James translation, specifically so that they could get those capital letters. But hey, I jump Bible translations as well, all the time, in order to get to the versions that is most favorable to the point that I'm making. But for me, I feel like this is justified. If God is the all-powerful creator and the Bible is his special message for us, then surely all the translations of that message are also the inerrant word of God? Otherwise, you need to admit that human beings are capable of mistranslating his word, thereby corrupting its message, which then leaves us with the idea that only the original documents in the original language are inerrant, which leaves us in quite the predicament given that most of us don't speak those languages, and that we don't have access to a single original document to even verify that the original language document was copied accurately in the first place. So in order to get to the conclusion that the Bible is the inerrant word of God, every translation must be the inerrant word of God, which would mean that these weird capitalizations are actually rather unimportant since they are not consistent. But there's more to it than this. You see, you're also ignoring the fact that the serpent has offspring here as well. The implication is that the distant descendant of Eve's would be Jesus, who would crush the head of the distant descendant of the serpent, who you guys think is the devil. So was Satan a mortal being then, who reproduced and then died at some point? That doesn't seem consistent with what most modern Christians think. So why do we place emphasis on the seed of the woman, while completely ignoring that it's not the same serpent later on? And of course, this also completely ignores the fact that in verse 14, God is clearly cursing a serpent as compared with the other beasts of the field, as though it's just a snake. Why would he need to curse Satan above the livestock? That's just a weird comparison to make for the being that Christians think Satan is. It makes sense for a serpent, but not for Satan. So yeah, there are many, many issues with pretending that this verse was supposed to be a messianic prophecy. So right after Adam and Eve sinned, God gives the promise of the seed that would come and crush the head of Satan and have victory over sin and death. And he does this through the cross, which is the next seed. Jesus' death and resurrection fulfills the promise given in Genesis 3.15. Not really. If it actually fulfilled it, then Christians wouldn't need to be worried about Satan today because Jesus already crushed his head about 2,000 years ago. Now, the rest of this is mostly just her preaching, so I just want to skip ahead to one last statement. Um, some people might say, well, what about things like homosexuality? What about things like um, transgender? And what, what about those things? What about those things is that you guys are objectively wrong on those things. And mostly I just wanted to plug the playlist that I've put together where I discuss those things specifically. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Alberto Gutierrez, who says, thanks for the background. I was beginning to miss them. So yeah, after using the 3D printed time lapses for a while, I'm finding something a little less busy would be desirable, and while I'm not going back to my usual rotation of all the Beeple clips that I used to use, this background that I use today was made specifically for me by the occasional game streamer Yolup. So I know that it's not going to be hit by the copyright bots when other YouTubers use it, because there shouldn't be other YouTubers using it. 
The 3D printed time lapses were a nice tribute to Mrs. Rhino, but I don't think I'll continue to use them from now on. Besides, I haven't been making new time lapses because it's bloody hot, and the 3D printer is in the hottest room of the house, which also happens to be the office that I work in, so I have been reluctant to turn on what's essentially a heater during the summer that has been marked by my phone constantly alerting me to the fact that this is a heat wave. I honestly think that there have been more heat wave days than not this year. Thanks for watching, thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon manager, Ross, Charles, and Tori for being my PayPal heroes, also I did get the t-shirts Charles, thank you very much, and special thanks as always to my patrons, who are the capital S in the three English translations of the Bible that point to the Old Testament prophesying about the coming of my channel. If you'd like to actually be evidence of people with theological agendas messing with their Bible translations, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time!